order. This hearing is titled A Review of the Fiscal Year 2024 President's Budget for the Department of the Interior. And we are most privileged to have with us today Secretary Holland. Welcome. And we have with her also uh, the Deputy, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy Management and Budget, Joan Mooney, welcome. And also the Department's Director of Budget, uh, Denise Flanagan, so welcome to you. Today's hearing will review the Department of Interior's fiscal year 2024 budget request. As I commented at our first hearing, I fully support Chair Murray and Vice Chair Collins in their resolve to move appropriation bills through committee and onto the floor this year, and I appreciate the aggressive schedule that they have laid out with that goal in mind and look forward to getting to work with my partner in this effort, Ranking Member Senator Murkowski. We must recognize as a Congress that non-defense funding is just as important as defense spending. Non-defense funding means investing in Americans, investing in childcare, in housing, in transportation infrastructure, and in this committee, it means supporting tribal governments, preventing catastrophic wildfire, protecting our land and waters from pollution and degradation. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for journeying to Oregon two weeks ago. It seems like longer, uh, but um, we had quite an opportunity to travel around the state. And you took the time not just to travel, but to listen to various communities within Oregon and the challenges that they face was very meaningful. Thank you for taking that trip. It was fitting that as we began our travels through the ancestral homelands of many tribes, you visited with Oregon's tribal leaders, leaders of tribal bands that have struggled to survive a century of devastating national policies and wars. You listened to their concerns about public safety and housing and health care and water infrastructure, and heard how their traditional ecological knowledge influences the tribe's modern practices in forest management and land conservation and how it can inform better policies across the state of Oregon and across the country. Your position as the first Native American cabinet secretary is historic, but the time that you took to make personal connections with the community, including a special session with the Klamath tribal community, was absolutely inspiring and made a big impact on all present. You also met with Oregon leaders in outdoor recreation to discuss improving access to our federal lands and outdoor recreation as an economic driver Outdoor recreation is indeed an economic force in Oregon, generating $13 billion in our economy. And you took the opportunity to visit two of Oregon's special places, Crater Lake National Park, the deepest lake in North America, and a reminder of the extraordinary power of the Cascade Volcanoes. And uh, you visited the Cascade Siskiyou National Monument, where because of its location at the crossroads of the Cascade, Klamath, and Siskiyou Ranges, the monument is an ecological wonder and absolutely deserving and needing protection. And it's a product of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, a critical tool for creating pathways to protect habitat for animals moving between these mountain systems, such as deer, elk, bear, cougar, foxes, and so forth. There's over 100 different butterflies in that monument, which is uh, an indication of the extraordinary diversity of those different ecosystems, including the Great Basin that comes in there. And uh, so the monument will increase uh, public access, but we have to work to make it so, and we heard a lot of suggestions on, on how to make that happen. And I appreciate the Interior Department's work on the revised monument plan, the management plan for the monument, and the scheduled completion by October of 2024. I certainly urge if anything, earlier if possible. One of the aspects of that planning will be wildfire risk reduction. Wildfires are having such a big impact on our natural lands and our communities, and Congress has provided significant funding for wildfire risk reduction. One of my goals, and I think it's uh, shared by Senator Murkowski, is that we invest on both ends, on making our forests healthier and more fire resilient on the front end with forest management, and also investing to make sure we have the resources to fight the fires on public lands as, uh, as needed because our fire season is longer, hotter, and more savage. Funding was provided for this effort in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, in the Inflation Reduction Act, in our, and in our annual appropriation bills. 
but the Interior Department is charged with making sure the funding is spent in the right places. And one of the things that I wanted to uh, uh, just mention is that the Rogue Valley is the highest risk fire shed in the state of Oregon. It desperately needs those investments from the department, and I'll certainly be working with you towards that goal. A factor aggravating the ferocity of these fires is climate chaos, longer, hotter fire seasons, smaller average snowpacks that affect the size and temperature of our streams and rivers, has a big impact with smaller, warmer streams hurting our trout and our, our salmon, and it means a lot less water for our, our ranchers, a lot less water for our farmers, and uh, that has just been a huge challenge uh, in multiple regions, suffering multi-year droughts. And I wanted to uh, show a picture from our visit to Crater Lake. We, we met with two volunteer park rangers. And I must say, um, being assigned and you get these, these volunteer park rangers work for a period of, of several months, three months at a time. And um, they have housing and, and food covered and, and work every day and have a phenomenal experience. Uh, it's, I was kind of envious of, of their jobs. And uh, this uh, is a picture of Ellie uh, Paxson, and she was joined in, in doing a presentation by Cassie Padula. Uh, they both were incredibly knowledgeable about the ecosystem of Crater Lake and about the impact of, of climate and, sh and pointed out many of the changes that we could observe just from where we were standing. And then uh, uh, Ellie provided this chart which is an indication, one way of summarizing. and I've been saying many, many times that the average snowpack in the Cascades is, is dropping decade after decade, which is why we're having troubles with our streams and with our irrigation water. And she really dramatized it with this chart that I had not seen before, where 90 years ago, the average snowfall over the decade was 614 inches, and it just drops decade after decade after decade. We're down to now about 370 inches or approaching half of what it was 90 years ago. And that amount of water stored in, when we think about uh, uh, some, uh, well, what are we looking at, 260, uh, 240 inches lost, uh, that's 20 feet of, of snow, 20 feet of water stored uh, that uh, isn't there now, that was there before. And of course, the IPCC report paints an even bleaker picture of the challenges worldwide. So it's so important that we quickly and dramatically pivot from fossil fuel energy economy to a renewable energy economy. I am disappointed that the administration has issued new leases for oil and gas or new projects because it's so important as we try to tackle this challenge that America lead the way. And to lead the way, we have to have the power of our example. And we also need to be thoughtful about how we build out the new energy economy. Uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Man Management, BOEM, it has a top-down process. And this is really a difficult uh, or system for offshore wind because off the coast of Oregon, we have all of these stakeholder communities. We have folks who are trawling for ground fish, for whiting, for salmon, for shrimp. We have a robust crab industry. And the, uh, the concept of uh, floating turbines, which may end up being a huge con contributor to renewable energy, but it's, it's untested and, and not well understood. And uh, we're being told that the anchors will have a seven to one ratio, which means if you go a mile deep in the ocean, you have a seven mile long anchor. How does that affect all these other industries? These other industries are absolutely terrified. Uh, we don't have transparency. We don't have an understanding of the technology and how to make these various pieces fit cleanly together. And so my uh, argument here is let's have a process that develops a full understanding of what those floating wind turbines would look like and how to make them completely compatible and in partnership with the existing stakeholders in our offshore uh, or our, our uh, sea life uh, um, stakeholders. So appreciate any, any help you can give to develop a better, more collaborative approach in that re regard. Again, thank you for your deep concern for our public lands, uh, how to uh, uh, make them accessible, uh, how to protect them for the next generation. And um, I, you are just, I know you're working 
every moment of every day towards that goal. Let me turn to the ranking member of the committee, Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and good morning, Madam Secretary, to you and to your team. I join Senator Merkley, the chairman here, in welcoming you back to the committee. I'm pleased to have the opportunity this morning to discuss the President's budget request along with some of the issues that are very important to me and, and to my state. And, and to begin with, um, I will begin with a, a topic that you and I have uh, have, have shared conversation on um, most recently, just just last week. You have heard me uh, express my deep, deep frustration and concern uh, with regards to the people of, of King Cove and the fact that they lack a life-saving road. And Madam Secretary, I, I want to acknowledge first uh, the appreciation that I have that you and your team uh, joined me in King Cove last year, so you could not only see, but you could hear directly from, from the people there. You could hear their concern, um, try to walk in their shoes for a brief moment in, in time. Uh, I also acknowledge the fact that your Deputy Secretary and uh, Raina Thiel, I believe, are out there. If not today, they were out there this week. Um, uh, in fairness, I hadn't heard what the weather was like and whether they have made it in and out. But I know that this was an effort for them to uh, to do follow on to have further discussion. Um, but as you know, the announcement that was made last week uh, to to withdraw from the um, from the, the litigation was was shocking to the people of King Cove, and I appreciate the fact that you you had a direct conversation by Zoom with them. Um, I have had subsequent conversations, and I will share with you. They are they're, they're somewhat confused. They don't know who to believe anymore. That's the problem, and I think part of this stems to a lack of trust, uh, a lack of of promises made and promises unfulfilled, a little bit of a pulling the rug out from underneath us, Lucy in the football, take your analogy, but, but a concern that once again, this might not be anything more than, than a false promise and that deeply, deeply concerns them because they need action that helps solve problems, not actions that further delay solutions. They need to be respected for the care that they have shown to their lands. And I think you, you heard that, you saw that. Um, they need to have these medevacs as, as nothing more than a memory, not, not a life-threatening reality in times of crisis. And Madam Secretary, I use the word to you uh, in our private meeting, and I will repeat it here at this hearing. They need you to be a warrior for them. They need to know that you recognize the longstanding suffering that they have faced and that you will stand with them to work with them. And I, I take you at your word that you were prepared to do this for this community. But know, know the, uh, the, the reservation that they have. Um, I'll have an opportunity to ask a question in more detail about that. But, uh, I, I do want to acknowledge the voices of, of some extraordinary, uh, extraordinary coalition of Alaska Native leaders and the individuals that came together to make their voices heard about the importance of the reapproval of the Willow Project, not only to those who work and raise their families on the North Slope of Alaska, but to our nation's economic security, our energy security, and our national security. And I am so very grateful and appreciative that the President listened to the voices of those Alaskans and took another step towards making this project in the National Petroleum Reserve a reality. Now, unfortunately, those who were disappointed in this decision are going to try to mire the project down in the courts in an attempt to prevent production, but it's my hope that this environmentally sound and balanced domestic project will not be delayed too much longer. I, I truly believe our national security requires that we increase our domestic supply of resource, including from our offshore areas. And speaking to that, I'd like to raise the recently leaked memo regarding the Cook Inlet Outer Continental Shelf lease sale 
that was required by the Inflation Reduction Act. Mr. Chairman, we're going to submit a copy of that memorandum for the record. But like many, without objection. Thank you. Like many of my colleagues, I was, I was, I was dismayed. I was really actually stunned by the recommendations that were contained in that leaked memo and the direction that it represents um, for this administration uh, when it relates to energy policy. According to the memo, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Lands and Mineral Management signed off on a plan that rejected the option that would have improved energy reliability and affordability for Alaskans. This was stated in the memo in favor of an alternative that was admittedly aimed at discouraging development, admits that that was the intended purpose here. This obviously represents the exact wrong direction for Alaska, certainly the wrong direction for a country. And when you think about the message that it sends um, about this administration's desire for energy security, again, it's, it's just, it's almost mind boggling to me. Right now, within the South Central area that relies on natural gas to keep our to keep our lights on, to keep the, the economy moving here, um, we're looking at a situation where the region that hosts about one half the population of the state of Alaska is 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 looking at at, at brownouts as a as a reality of of uh, of diminishing supplies there in in Cook Inlet and um, the thought that we may be importing LNG from Canada now, to me as an Alaskan from a state that has extraordinary natural gas reserves. The fact that we would, we, we would even be uttering these words is almost inconceivable to me. A failure to have meaningful oil and gas programs, including in the 1002 area where the administration is illegally disregarding the law, will reduce domestic investment at the worst possible time for our country and our global allies. Domestic supply matters to our energy security and also matters to our mineral security. And I have long pointed to the dangers of our growing dependence on foreign minerals and advocated for a strong domestic supply for our national security, economy, and competitiveness. Like offshore oil and gas, one of the keys to permitting this challenge is for the department to actually make mine permit determinations in a timely manner. If we want to be competitive in the global market, a producer and not just an importer, we cannot afford for it to take 10 years to permit a mine on our public lands. Alaska is willing and able to increase our nation's and our allies' energy security. All we need is permission from the federal government, access to our federal lands, and the timely approval of our permit applications. And when we do get those approvals, Alaskans, we get it. We cherish, we respect our lands, our waters, while developing these resources and doing it in a responsible manner. So to turn to other areas here, and, and certainly areas that the chairman has noted we have agreement on, and that's working together to provide resources for our tribal communities. Our subcommittee plans to have a hearing with Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs Brian Newland and IHS uh, Director So regarding tribal programs where I'm going to go in depth on our shared tribal commitments. But I do also want to join the chairman in thanking you for your efforts on behalf of tribes, whether it's public safety and justice, natural resources, or construction programs. Working to address the tribal needs has always been a bipartisan and a bicameral priority. We know that the appropriations process is never easy. It's never quick, that's for sure. Um, but it is important for us to continue our bipartisan approach to these issues to ensure success across Indian country. Public lands, certainly a key attraction for visitors to Alaska and drivers of economic activity. And while we have not seen a complete return to pre-COVID tourism numbers, visitation is certainly increasing. Uh, I'm pleased the department is working to get Alaska's national parks and preserves ready to welcome visitors this summer. But our parks are far more than playgrounds. They set aside they are set aside for harvesting wildlife as laid out in Anilka, and the department is improperly trying to interfere with subsistence hunting practices. 
So these are just a few of the, the issues that are on my mind this morning as they relate to Alaska, but we have, of course, broader and shared interests at the national level. Madam Secretary, I do appreciate your willingness to work with me on areas that we have agreement. Uh, as you continue to hear from and listen to Alaskans, I hope that we can even find greater areas of, of how we can how we can be working together to, to grow uh, Alaska's role in our nation's economy, our energy, our mineral security, while also cherishing and protecting our lands, our people, and our culture. So again, look forward to the questions this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, the floor is yours. Chair Merkley, Ranking Member Murkowski, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Interior's fiscal year 2024 budget request. Our 2024 budget totals $18.9 billion in current authority, an increase of $2 billion from the 2023 level. First, I want to highlight several important proposals. These include significant reforms to support the wildland fire workforce, mandatory funding for future Indian water rights settlements, expanding good neighbor and stewardship contracting authorities to include Fish and Wildlife Service and National Park Service, reclassifying legally required tribal sovereignty payments, contract and leasing costs from discretionary to mandatory funding, and $6.5 billion over 20 years from the Department of State to fund economic assistance under the Compacts of Free Association. Let me begin with our Indian Affairs budget request. This administration has made a steadfast commitment to strengthen government-to-government -government relations with our country's Indian tribes. With a total request of $4.7 billion for Indian Affairs programs, investments will address missing and murdered indigenous peoples, the legacy of federal Indian boarding schools, and the native language revitalization. BIA's budget includes $48 million for the Tribal Climate Resilience Program to support climate resilience planning, including relocation. In response to concerns by tribal leaders for public safety in their communities, the budget includes an increase of nearly $86 million above 2023. We also request $1.6 billion for Indian education programs. Notably, the 2024 request for BIE construction will support seven school projects. Turning to wildland fire, the 2024 budget honors President Biden's commitment to address this issue and to assist firefighters supporting an additional 370 federal and 55 tribal fire personnel. Complementing the pay reforms, we also include $293.3 million for fuels management activities, an increase of $46.3 million above 2023. These investments are crucial as wildfires were noticeably higher in 2022 than the 10-year average. Stewardship of our natural resources is a core mission for us as Interior manages about 20% of America's lands. Our request covers $3.2 billion in annual funding for conservation efforts that supports key initiatives such as wildlife corridors and youth core partnerships. The request also includes $140 million for Fish and Wildlife Service partnership programs that support voluntary conservation on public and private lands, which is a key focus of the America the Beautiful initiative. To complement the $681 million for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, I'm proud to propose $12 million in discretionary funding for a new tribal LWCF program, which is a top priority for tribes. At the department, Science is our foundation. The United States Geological Survey works with partners across the country to maintain 20,000 groundwater monitoring wells, 11,800 stream gauges, and 3,800 earthquake sensors, and directly monitor 70 volcanoes. The budget includes $128 million that supports nine regional climate adaptation science centers with university partners. We are also looking forward to the Landsat Next mission that will take advantage of new technologies for global imaging data. When it comes to energy, we're excited to be on our way to achieve the administration's goals to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity by 2030. As of last month, 
Boehm has conducted 11 energy lease sales for areas in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. That's more than the 2.5 million acres of commercial wind energy lease areas. The budget includes over $64 million for Boehm's renewable energy program, including a $12 million increase for permitting. Onshore, BLM is also making progress to, per to, re to permit 25 gigawatts of renewable energy on public lands by 2025. BLM has permitted more than 126 renewable energy projects, processed many more, and is willing to support much needed transmission lines. To meet these needs, we include $72 million for BLM's renewable energy program. At the end of 2020, interior staffing was at a 10-year low of around 60,500. When fully enacted, the budget would support an increase of 4,000 personnel to over 68,000. Regarding infrastructure, our request includes more than $3 billion for operations and maintenance. In addition, there, $1.6 billion in mandatory funding available each year through 2025 through the Legacy Restoration Fund. At the end of 2023, our Legacy Restoration Fund program will have initiated 276 projects touching all 50 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Those projects will address $3.4 billion of our deferred maintenance backlog creating an average of 17,000 jobs each year. Overall, the President's Budget for Interior invests in programs to strengthen our nation for all Americans. I look forward to doing this work together. Thank you, and I'm pleased, uh, we're all pleased to answer any questions that you have today. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. And uh, we're going to uh, have seven minute uh, rounds of, of questioning. I, I'm going to try to get through three tribal questions uh, during that seven minutes. And I wanted to start uh, with the issue of the importance of public safety and justice funding for our tribes. We have a complicated system of jurisdiction over law enforcement on, on tribal lands. Sometimes the tribe is responsible, sometimes the federal government is responsible. We also have a complicated system of funding for tribal public safety and justice programs. There are tribes that are eligible for receiving federal funding, but uh, are not able to kind of get inside the club, if you will, including five tribes in Oregon and some 30 tribes uh, nationwide. Uh, for this reason, I advocated for and, and we included in last year's uh, funding bill uh, $7 million for startup funding for the department to begin consultations with tribes to determine the extent of the problem and to provide a small amount of base funding to the tribes that now want to participate who would otherwise be eligible but have been excluded so far. Can you uh, update us on, on how the consultation is proceeding and how the money will be spent under this program? Thank you, Chairman, and we appreciate the support on that. The Indian Affairs is finalizing the list of eligible tribes, and we expect to deliver that to Congress in the coming weeks. Um, as soon as that list is provided, we'll announce a consultation with the impacted tribes regarding how the funding should be allocated. And do you have some sense of, of how the allocation of, like, formula might work? Um, we're happy to get back with your you, with your office uh, on those specific details. Great. Okay, I'm going to turn to the second question, uh, which is the the budget you have put before us proposes 642. I'm rounding off million uh, for a Bureau of Indian Affairs public safety and justice programs and uh, boosting the boots on the ground, if you will, across Indian country seems to be a central tenet of this request. The Tribal Law and Order Act report shows an unmet need of $3.5 billion for public safety, so we obviously have a huge disparity or a huge challenge in that regard. But in addition to boots on the ground is this goal of, um, well, preventing crime before it happens. Always better uh, uh, if, if a problem never occurs, a crime is never committed. Can you describe how your budget addresses not just the need for law enforcement, but also crime prevention and the Tiwahi initiative? Senator, thank you so much for that question. First, I'll, I'll just say that um, tribal public safety and justice are, are one of the top priorities of tribes across the country. And so um, we understand the need for this. 
Um, I just want to say that um, there are always um, there are always uh, a need to make sure that we have the staffing uh, in those areas, and we, you know, part of that is making sure that that the benefits and and pay for these tribal communities um, are at a level that doesn't um, that helps them to want to stay where they are. Uh, we've had a problem with. Um, you know, we, tr we train tribal police officers up and then they find a more, a, a, a better paying job elsewhere. And so um, we're working very hard to retain um, the staff that we have in those areas. And I think that's one of the largest um, issues. And this uh, particular initiative that began in 2015, as I understand it, Tiwahi, uh, means family in the Lakota language and symbolizes the interconnectedness of, of uh, all beings and was launched with a series of pilot projects in six communities with the goal of reducing crime on the front end. Any update on how those pilot pro programs are going? Senator, I will, I'd be happy to, uh, we'll be happy to update your staff specifically on the Tehoahi right. Initiative, if that's okay with you. Thank we'll you. get with you um, soon. Thank you, that would, that would be great. And then um, I'm happy to see the President's budget requests reclassifying contract support costs and 105L building leases as mandatory funding. And you know, that's a mouthful, contract support costs and 105L leases, and what are those? Well, essentially, they are the administrative overhead and leasing costs that a tribe bears when it opts into self-government. And twin court cases have affirmed that the federal government is required to reimburse tribes for these costs. And I want to emphasize that word, required. And uh, so what are these costs uh, really? Well, what they are is the cost of a tribe exercising its sovereignty to run their own programs. And for this reason, uh, the um, uh, term that uh, I've been encouraging is to call these tribal sovereignty payments because they're required and therefore it makes sense that they are done in as mandatory uh, funding. And uh, so uh, I don't know if that term is one that resonates with you, but I thought I would, would ask you in terms of its, its role and if you'd like to elaborate on this, this goal of having those two required expenses classified as mandatory funding. I appreciate your support of this, Chairman. And um, yes, I mean, I mean, you said it all. Uh, they are required by law. Um, these costs are not optional, and so it stands to reason that that we this is a it's a mandatory. There's no option for this, so we have to pay. Um, so, uh, for example, if a tribe requests com compensation for the use of law enforcement facilities they built and paid for. The BIA must develop a 105L lease agreement and provide the associated funding. So there's, there's, these are things that we have to do. So um, we appreciate the support on that, and thank you for supporting tribes. Do you like that term, tribal sovereignty payments? I think it's great. Thank you. I'll turn this over to Senator Murkowski. Madam Secretary, uh, let's begin with um, the first uh, part of my opening statement, which, which was referenced to to the people of King Cove, and I, I, I talked about the medevacs. We want to put that um, we want to put that into just nothing more than bad memories. But there's been more than 200 medevacs that King Cove has endured over the past nine years. Uh, 28 of those by the Coast Guard um, risks their crews' lives, costs. Ta taxpayer dollars, you've, you've heard it all. Um, you have not yet had an opportunity to speak on the record yet about what your department is doing with regards to the situation in King Cove and why. So if you can this morning say to the committee um, about why your department withdrew from the land exchange agreement and more importantly, uh, what can you tell the Alaska Native people of, of King Cove to assure them that you will finally be the secretary that protects their health and safety. Thank you very much, um, Senator, for that question. Um, so the 
the land exchange that we withdrew, as I mentioned to you when we spoke, um, was essentially flawed. And uh, we felt that by the time it uh, wound its way through, that um, it would take a very long time and that perhaps we could um, uh, work toward a better solution in a quicker time frame. Um, with respect to the people of King Cove, yes, the, I have, I have um, like it happened yesterday, uh, my time there with them uh, and with you uh, last year um, resonates with me, uh, and I've met twice with them uh, virtually and once in person, so I've heard the stories and I understand um, how difficult it is for the people there to get the services they need. We also visited the clinic. Uh, there's no way for them to, it can't be, you know, Anchorage General Hospital on King Cove. There's, all, there's this, the medical services they get there are limited, so we completely understand that too, and the weather. Uh, so doctors can't even get into the community at times. So we understand all of those challenges and I really want to find a solution for the people of King Cove so that they don't have to worry about um, getting the medical care that they need. Um, I, um, you know, what I said to, in my last meeting <clears throat> virtually with the leadership at King Cove was that, um, you know, I know that people tell them, move to Anchorage. Why don't you move somewhere where you can get the health care you need? And that's not for us to decide. Uh, we have, our department has an obligation to our nation's Indian tribes. We have a trust and treaty obligation uh, that absolutely includes health care, health care, education, housing, and so forth. So, um, so we are committed to ensuring that the people of King Cove can once and for all find a solution to, um, to this terrible um, it, tragedy in so many ways. Um, and and so um, I just want you to know that uh, two of my high-level staff were just there in King Cove yesterday. As promised, we're following through with our commitment to, uh, to meet with them, to keep them informed. Uh, we want to make sure that, they, uh, that we're informing them um, every step of this way. And so I, I just want to let you know that I, I am committed to a solution there. And Madam Secretary, I appreciate that you say you're committed to a solution. Are you committed to a land exchange that will allow for the 10-mile one-lane gravel non-commercial use road that will allow the people of King Cove to gain access to, to transportation to take them to, to the, the public health facilities that they need? Senator, I, I just, I don't want to, um, all of these things are pre-decisional and I don't want to, um, to uh, um, I guess, um, uh, cause any part of this to fail on my part. So I just want to assure you that we're committed to a, a viable solution for the people of King Cove. When and we will keep them informed of that. You, you and I recognize that um, uh, processes like a land exchange cannot be done with a snap of a finger, cannot be done overnight, that they take time. Uh, we can all count backwards um, from the, the end of, of a term. Um, we can all look at, uh, at at steps along the way when it comes to a required EIS and how long the, the process takes. And I would suggest to you that we do not have unlimited time mm -hmm. to do this under your watch. And if you are committing to the people of King Cove and you're committing to me that you will find a solution that will address their public safety concerns, we don't have the luxury of, of time. And so the promise to just keep us informed, in my view, is not satisfactory. If we're going to accomplish this, if we're going to address the wrongs that have been, have, have literally been, been perpetuated on, on these native people, 
uh, by a government that basically came in and said, this area that you have utilized, that you have used for access, for hunting, for your cabins, we're going to designate as a, as a, as a wilderness, as a refuge area, and no consultation, no input whatsoever, just cut off. Um, you know that's not right. They know that's not right, and we need to rectify this. We've been working on this now for over 30 years. For over 30 years, 200 medevacs. People died. You've talked to, you have heard from those whose lives have been forever changed by the inability to gain access to a simple, one-lane gravel, non-commercial use road. It ought not be this hard. I need you to be this warrior. I want us to be looking at how, how we can legislate, because we know that that will be the quicker route. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. I'm going to turn to uh, the chair of the Appropriations Committee, Senator Murray. Well, thank you very much, Chair Merkley and Ranking Member Murkowski. I'm really pleased that both of you are leading this uh, important subcommittee because I know both of you understand, like Vice Chair Collins and I do, that we have a responsibility to work in a timely fashion in a bipartisan way to pass these funding bills uh, that keep our families safe and our nation strong and competitive. So I look forward to working with both of you uh, to do just that as we return to regular order. And this hearing is an important reminder uh, on how these issues this subcommittee deals with are critical to all of our families back home. For one, uh, we have to make sure our nation lives up to its commitment to our tribes, uh, providing the necessary federal support and honoring our commitment to their sovereignty. Uh, that's why I want to underscore my support for Chair Merkley's efforts on tribal sovereignty payments. We also have a moral obligation to leave the next generation a world in, in better shape than we found it. So we have to keep in mind defense spending isn't the only way that we protect our nation. The critical issues we're talking about here today are directly connected to the security of our country and the strength of our economy. We have to protect and restore our environment so we can pass on to our kids clean air and thriving forests and healthy ecosystems that support strong communities. And we must ensure that our kids have safe drinking water, free of lead contamination and harmful chem chemicals like PFAS. Our national parks are national treasures, bringing in tourists and dollars from around the world to local communities in every corner of our nation and giving our families a great place to see the outdoors and explore our country. They also remind us that our security and our strength directly connected to how well we care for our environment, our ability to tackle the climate crisis, for instance, because families are less safe when climate disasters become more frequent, when wildfires devastate our communities. Any Western state can tell you that. When ecosystems are upended by invasive species, like we're dealing with the European cra green crab in Washington state right now, or when rising temperatures create prolonged droughts impacting our farmers and our wildlife and our day-to-day -day life. And we, when we fail to prevent and respond to those disasters, we are weaker and less competitive in the world as well. In my home state of Washington, salmon is a way of life. They are a huge part of our economy, our history, and our culture. Protecting and restoring salmon habitat and increasing salmon runs is key to our state's strength and its future. And saving salmon is also a part of, our meet, of meeting our obligation to our tribes. And there's so many other examples like this that make clear why protecting our land and our water and our air and our environment is so important to our country's future. So I'm very glad to have this opportunity to discuss how we can invest in doing just that to strengthen our nation. So Secretary Holland, welcome to the committee. Um, as I mentioned, salmon is a way of life in my home state. Can you talk about how this budget will help with salmon recovery and what investments will support hatchery maintenance and operations? Uh, thank you very much, Chair Murray. And um, yes, salmon is a way of life for so many communities, and I've been able to visit many of those communities, so I understand the. Um, it's not just 
it's not just susten it's not just the food you eat, but it's a cultural way of life for so many people. Um, so, uh, and I'm very proud of our fish hatcheries. In fact, I went to a fish hatchery when I was in um, Oregon just a couple weeks ago. Um, but around one million to two million salmon now return to the Columbia Basin annually. Of those, a majority are hatchery fish. So we, those are important um, um, entities that we want to make sure that we support. The budget maintains support for hatchery operation and includes significant increase, $15 million to address hatchery deferred maintenance work, um, $80 million for national fish hatchery operations. That's a, a plus uh, $6 million for this budget and uh, plus $23 million on hatchery maintenance and equipment. Okay, thank you. Well, this is something I'm going to follow very closely, so I know both of our, our committee chair and ranking member will as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about the European green crab. It is a globally damaged invasive species that is of particular concern in my home state. We need to get ahead of this now to protect the native crab populations. How does U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service intend to work with National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to address this threat? Um, thank you. And invasive species, of course, across the country is a giant concern for all of us. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service continues to coordinate and participate in European green crab control efforts. Uh, and we work with partners. They work with partners to develop a draft national control plan, and that's expected in April. Um, uh, and also, um, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, conducts early detection, monitoring, control, and removal of these crabs on Pacific Northwest refuges, the refuges that Fish and Wildlife Service manages. So um, uh, it also provides grants to states uh, to implement statewide aquatic nuisance species management plans. So we'll work with states um, to make sure that we can help uh, with this invasive species. Okay, thank you. We'll be working with you on this as we move forward. Um, and finally, in the West, wildfire and droughts are actually two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. While this year's atmospheric rivers have given us a, a lot of rain, we know that climate change is impacting the long-term hydrology across our country. I re recently spoke with Commissioner Towton about Reclamation's work on droughts. I wanted to ask you about agencies within Interior um, how do they work in, in tandem to deal with the issue of drought? Uh, thank you. So we take an all of uh, Department of Interior approach to address uh, drought specifically in the West um, because we know we need to build long-term resilience. Um, and so that includes, um, that includes making sure that we're working not only with states, local communities, but also with Indian tribes. Um, and, and so um, the Geological Survey as well as the Fish and Wildlife Service both play a critical role in uh, working to remedy these um, impacts and our changing climate. Um, and they provide actionable science for land and water managers to inform resource management activities. Um, in 2024, the U.S. Geological Survey proposes $6.5 million to provide resource managers with decision support tools to better understand um, this issue. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Murray. And we're going to turn to uh, Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for being here today. I'd like to start by discussing the administration's America the Beautiful initiative. Could you tell us to date how much funding has DOI spent on implementing the America the Beautiful initiative? I appreciate the question. And um, I would actually, if it's OK with you, Senator, we can get back to your office with the exact funding. I don't have that in front of me at the moment. Okay, for example, um, can you tell me if staffing resources have been used to plan for it, um, coordinate, implement, or track the initiative? Um, thank you so much. Uh, the America the Beautiful, uh, okay, so we have 140 million, which is an increase of 34 million for Fish and Wildlife Service partnership programs. Um, I apologize, I just got the list. If that's okay, I'll, sure. I'll tell it to you. Um, 
182 million, which is an increase of 8 million for Fish and Wildlife Service conservation grant programs, and those go out. Uh, the people can apply to those grants uh, to um, help their projects, and um, 306 million dollars for NPS for the now, National Park Service. Is is that uh, funding that's been? currently spent or what you're planning to spend? Uh, we're, well, we're asking for increases okay. in the partnership programs and the conservation grants. Okay, I know um, in, in your request, you've um, listed the America the Beautiful initiative at least 86 times throughout uh, the budget justifications. I just wanted to bring to your attention that Nebraska is a private property state 97% of our land is privately owned. And as we look at this initiative, the fact that there is no clear authorization or appropriations from Congress um, means that there's no guardrails that's there. And I don't believe there's any accountability uh, for how you would spend those funds. So that's caused a lot of concern with my constituents. In fact, we have at least 70 counties in Nebraska that have issued resolutions of disapproval for the 30 by 30 initiative. Nebraskans are concerned that this effort is an attempt at a land grab by the federal government at worst, and it's a failure of the administration to recognize that private landowners are the best managers of their land at best. So given the level of concern that we see from Nebraskans and the majority of Nebraskans, can you tell me how, how the administration and how you are defining conservation in relationship to the goal that is um, listed with the America the Beautiful initiative and how much land today would meet that definition? Um, thank you. First of all, um, I'll say that we are working on an atlas that would um, help to um, an atlas that would essentially, you know, count the land. Um, we also um, want to mention that um, the America the Beautiful initiative. It's a. It's it's really based on locally led conservation. Um, there are a lot of private landowners who feel very strongly about conserving their lands, and they designate certain areas for certain things or animals. And so we um, we are we are happy to uh, work with private landowners. We know that they're the best stewards of their own lands as well, and we respect and appreciate that. Um, so it's locally led conservation partnerships. Um, uh, those are the conversations we're having now. Um, I recognize that uh, there might be a concern, but um, we are, it's it, the, the America the Beautiful initiative is based on a voluntary um, opportunity right. for I, private but I, land. But I would point out as you're, as you're working on this and, and working with mapping, uh, Congress hasn't provided any funds for this initiative. And I believe your job is to implement programs that Congress has provided funds for. So I would appreciate an accounting of any past or planned expenditures that you have. Salaries, programs, IT, reprogramming, the whole thing. That's going to, I think, be very helpful as we look at um, the interior appropriations Bill, so I, I hope that you do follow up with my staff on we, that. We absolutely will. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Also within the president's budget request, it includes um, one, $171.4 million to increase the environmental permitting capacity of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And DOI has requested Congress to provide legislative authority for other agencies to transfer funds from the bipartisan infrastructure bill to the Fish and Wildlife Service for Endangered Species Act consultations. I voted for the bipartisan infrastructure bill, and I voted for it to build infrastructure. 
uh, not to fund federal government permitting. And I want to be very, very blunt about this. I will strongly oppose mm -hmm. moving any of those taxpayer dollars from the bipartisan infrastructure bill that we passed on a bipartisan basis to increase any more federal permitting. I'm curious on what actions you have taken to streamline the ESA's consultations to ensure that they are not holding up bipartisan infrastructure dollars. The ESA, the Endangered, Endangered Species, Species Act. Act. OK, yes, thank you. Um, first of all, we are happy to get back with you on all of the things that you asked us about. We're happy to um, contact your staff as soon as we get back to the office. Um, the Endangered Species Act, of course, it is 50 years old. It has been a godsend to so many animals. The animals, you know, what we try to do really is recovery. We don't, um, we work with communities, people on the ground, local governments to ensure that we recover species. And uh, we really don't want to list species. We want to make sure that we're doing the work ahead of time so that they don't um, get to that level. Right, but they, but you should not be using bipartisan infrastructure bill dollars in order to do that. That should be, in my opinion, a separate line item for that agency to take care of the act. So I see my time is up. If we could follow up with my staff, I would sincerely appreciate yes, it. Yes, we will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Holland, it's uh, great to, to see you here today, and uh, thank you for all of uh, the work uh, that you are doing in a very important position. Uh, Secretary, the, uh, the Great Lakes Restoration uh, Initiative was established in 2009 to accelerate efforts to protect and restore one of the largest uh, systems of fresh uh, water uh, on the surface uh, in the entire world, and that is the, the Great Lakes. And as Michiganders, the Great Lakes are, are not only in our DNA, but are a critical uh, resource uh, for drinking water. In fact, uh, over 40 million people drink water uh, out of the Great Lakes, economic growth, uh, as well as job creation. And since 2010, the GLRI has provided over $2.9 billion to fund more than 6,000 projects uh, throughout the Great Lakes region, including uh, $762 million for 880 projects just uh, in Michigan alone. As one of uh, 16 GLR regional working group members, uh, the uh, Department of the Interior awards uh, competitive grants to assist organizations and communities who are taking very creative approaches to improve habitats uh, as well as uh, overall water quality. So my question for you, ma'am, is can you speak uh, to how the uh, Department of Interior utilizes GLRI funding to help improve water quality and in the process will accelerate Great Lakes uh, protection uh, as well as restoration. Thank you very much for the question, Senator. And um, our bureaus work uh, closely with the EPA as part of the Great Lakes, um, as part of this initiative. Uh, it's an important program for us and we're grateful that we can partner up on those things. Um, the USGS's work through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative focuses on research to prevent the establishment of invasive carps um, uh, in the Great Lakes. Um, and as we mentioned, invasive species is an issue across the country. Um, our sci the USGS scientists are also leading efforts in the Great Lakes to adaptively manage common reed, improve control of zebra and quagga mussels, and control invasive crayfishes. Um, so with our budget, we propose $104 million for work uh, for USGS research and Fish and Wildlife Service conservation and restoration work, um, refuges, and uh, facility operations. Wonderful. Well, we appreciate uh, your continued uh, uh, focus on that. The other issue that I'm uh, particularly interested in discussing uh, with you involves uh, National Park uh, employee wages. Uh, specifically looking at them in a, in a more granular level to better reflect uh, the cost of living uh, that they face uh, based on, on where they may be working. Uh, you know, for instance, employees working at the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, located in, in northern Michigan, uh, might be, be paid a lower rate than those um, working at a, a park service site, say, in Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cost of living, especially for seasonal workers, is extremely high. So if, when I 
was up there recently visiting. You, you have an amazing park facility there, uh, but it is a fairly remote area, and the only housing available is immediately around the park. And especially in uh, peak season with tourism, uh, that is prime, prime real estate. Uh, and it's difficult for folks to find housing, particularly when, in Michigan, which is very seasonal, as they come up in the summer, trying to get employees and workers is incredibly difficult given the cost of living just around the confines of the park. They would have to travel very long distances in order to be there and causes a, a real problem. So um, I, I would hope the department will take a closer look at uh, or the, the, uh, uh, and deciding out how to, the pay needs are, are different depending on park locations and in a more granular level than is currently uh, used and uh, would hope to get your commitment to, to look at that and certainly welcome any thoughts you have on how we might approach it. Absolutely. Um, housing is an issue across the country and in many our national parks, the uh, gateway communities, we know they're expensive. And so we're, we work with partners and, uh, and not only that, but climate change has been an issue as well. Some housing was washed away, quite frankly, um, at Yellowstone um, in the last flood they had. So um, we are, uh, so we're working on the housing issue and uh, we're, we're working to bring people together to figure that out. Uh, but also just wanted to assure you that uh, we have government-wide recruitment and retention incentives available and those are available to all agencies. And so we're working hard to make sure that we can offer those incentives those pay incentives to the folks who take these important jobs um, in those remote areas. So uh, we we will we're happy to keep you informed, but appreciate uh, you caring about that. And and we know that there's two sides to that: the housing plus the pay. So we're working on both. Right. Good. To, good to hear. We we'll look forward to continuing to, to work with you as well. Uh, National heritage areas have also proven um, a record uh, of fostering uh, job creation and advancing economic, cultural, historic, natural, as well as uh, community development. Uh, and in addition to creating jobs, uh, national heritage areas generate uh, valuable revenue for uh, local governments and help sustain governments through revitalization uh, efforts, as well as uh, heritage uh, tourism, which is a, a, a large and growing industry. Uh, they have uh, enjoyed very long-standing bipartisan support, and through an innovative public-private partnership, uh, NHAs have effectively leveraged uh, federal resources, uh, attracting on average of $5.50 uh, of private funding for each dollar appropriated, providing nearly a six-to-one return on investments uh, for taxpayers, which mm -hmm. is uh, a pretty powerful investment, having spent a lot of years in the investment business prior to uh, being in public service. If you tell an investor for every dollar you invest, you get six, uh, people are usually very happy uh, with uh, with that. And Michigan Motor City's National Heritage Area alone has created an economic impact of nearly $490 uh, million. Mm -hmm. so my question for you, Madam Secretary, with last year's passage of the National Her Heritage Area Act authorizing seven new NHAs, could you speak to the importance of ensuring that this uh, program uh, has the necessary funding uh, to be effective and successful in all of these new areas? Absolutely. Well, we always um, appreciate um, uh, locally driven partnerships and NHAs are, are one way that, um, that people invest there. So thank you for that. Uh, the 2024 budget maintains funding for the NHAs at the 2023 level. It's $29 million. Um, the funding includes initial support for the areas established in 2023, 150,000 each, and reduces amounts for areas which received more than 500,000 in 2023. So we're working to balance that out, but um, we'll support them as much as we can and appreciate your support as well. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Britt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Madam Secretary, thank you for being here today and testifying before this, in commi this committee. <clears throat> Our nation's public lands are an amazing resource and we have a responsibility to manage them effectively. Effective stewardship, however, does not mean simply closing them off from all humanity. Stewardship of our public lands includes finding appropriate economic development to sustain local businesses and our national economy. Warrior Met Coal is one of our US companies trying to work with the federal government to be a good steward of our public lands. 
Warrior Met Coal is an important economic driver in the state of Alabama. They employ 1,000 people and are the largest customer of our port of Mobile. The company focuses on mining Met Coal. And as you know, Met Coal is a specific type of coal needed to make specialty steel used for roads, bridges, automobiles, renewable energy components, and a wide array of other critical, uh, critical uses. The department currently has a moratorium on the mining of thermal coal, which is used for energy production. However, we know that met coal is not the same as thermal coal, and the Department of Justice has stated that met coal is not subject to the reinstatement of the federal coal moratorium. Warrior Met Coal has had an application with the Department of Interior to develop 24 million tons of Met Coal on federal lands right next to their current operations in Tuscaloosa County, Alabama. Warrior Met developed their application in cooperation with the department, a process they started in 2009 and then restarted in 2014. They have jumped through every hoop that the department has asked because they want to make sure that they are good stewards of our public lands. Frustratingly, it has been nearly a year since they have received a substantial update from the department. We believe that enough is enough. We find the lack of transparency and communication entirely unacceptable, as do many Alabamians negatively impacted by this bureaucratic stonewall. The only feedback the company has heard is, quote, the environmental analyst for this application is, um, currently under technical and legal review, unquote. Madam Secretary, how long do you think a complete application should take um, to review? It would seem to me that this is something that we could commit to finishing in a few weeks and, and not months. Thank you very much for the question, Senator. And I know that <clears throat> these things can be frustrating sometime. <clears throat> What I'll say that um, the BLM has made me aware of the importance of this project to you in the state. Um, and uh, I understand that it's under review and ongoing now. They, uh, an important part of BLM's review is ensuring that it's consistent with any and all court decisions, uh, recent court decisions. And so I know that they're working through all of those issues as well. Um, we are ha more than happy to uh, make sure that you get that you you get updated. That we get in touch with your staff and update you on the status of this project. Um, I wish there was more that I could report now, um, but we as soon as we can, um, you know, get a firm update, we're, we're happy to get back in touch with you. I know that's not what you want to hear, but um, but we'll do our best. Um, Madam Secretary, I appreciate it. And what I hear from you is a commitment to keep me updated on this. I'd love to have your senior staff come over and brief me um, on any problems with the application. We have a lot of um, jobs and people who are working to achieve the American dream and all of that is hanging in the balance on this decision. And we want to be good stewards of the land. We want to make this work in a way that works with the department. We are doing our part. We need you all to do yours. So will you commit to me that you will send senior staff over to brief me on any type of impediments that we're having so that we can find a way to work through those and get this back on track? One of my staff will be in touch with your staff uh, very soon, and we'll figure out a time and day that suits you. Thank you. I Thank very you. much appreciate Thank that. Thank you, ma'am. Um, completing that application would mean a great deal, not only to um, the, the hardworking uh, men and women at Warrior Met, but obviously the community and the Port of Mobile and our state, so I appreciate that. Um, also, we want to make sure that everyone understands that the status quo just keeps the Chinese Communist Party um, in control, and they produce the same kind of coal with obviously without environmental standards that we have in the U.S. So I think improving this lease would elevate our economy, keep production of this critical met coal in the U.S., and provide a cleaner solution than what we're doing or what they are doing there in China. So I believe it is a win for everyone. So look forward to meeting with your staff and figuring out how we can cut through the red tape. Madam Secretary, I want to flag for you that the Biden administration's new Waters of the U.S. rule is particularly harmful for the state of Alabama. This new rule is going to negatively impact over 64,000 small businesses in the great state of Alabama. Did you have a chance to review the rule during the interagency review process? Um, 
Uh, Senator, I apologize. I will have to get back with you okay. about that rule, and we're happy to um, to be in touch with you about that. Okay, I would and, and noted your your opposition to it. Yes, I, I just I'm hopeful that it wasn't rushed through for political purposes. This has um, significant impact. Uh, Alabama has a lot of private landowners adjacent to public lands, and as I consistently say, there are no greater stewards of our lands than our farmers, our foresters, and our cattlemen. Um, when we increase the burdens on these private landowners, we make it hard for them to care for their lands. And when their lands are harder to steward, I believe it has a negative impact impact on taking care of our public lands. So I hope that you will consider taking a look at this. I'd love to have further dialogue um, so that we can make sure that protecting our public lands by defending private landowners from unnecessary burdens um, that our government places on them. Uh, one last final question, since I have a few more seconds. Um, I'm also concerned about the Biden administration's consistent opposition to oil and gas. Um, I want you to know that the Green New Deal policies and the foot dragging have downstream impacts for the people of Alabama. Two years ago, a gallon of gasoline in Alabama cost less than two bucks. Since then, prices have risen over 50%. Alabamians depend on affordable gas to get groceries, to drive to work, to pick up their kids from school, and to go to church. I hope that you and the rest of this administration will start considering how the Green New Deal policies are failing the American people. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to following up on these important issues. Thank you. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Tester. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, great to see you. Thank you for your service. I know you've got a lot of territory to cover at the Department of Interior, the entire United States, uh, but I don't think you'll be surprised that I focus on the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And when it comes to protecting this national treasure and natural treasure, uh, the EPA has a very important role when it comes to water quality, uh, but the Department of Interior also has important roles uh, through the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, through the National Park Service and some of the other uh, agencies. So one of the things we created in Congress on a bipartisan basis years ago uh, was the WILD program under the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to protect habitat around the Chesapeake Bay uh, and also protect the water quality of the bay. It was also consistent with President Biden's America, the beautiful plan, uh, pr protecting 30% of our lands. So, Madam Secretary, uh, I will say I was very disappointed, very disappointed that the budget that was submitted uh, by the Biden administration zeroed out the funding for this program. It was $8 million uh, provided by Congress last year. In your budget submission, it was zero. Uh, you have been You've given lots of um, vocal support to protecting the Bay, but you're in front of an appropriations committee. We tend to measure commitment by whether it's backed up uh, by resources and investment. So could you just talk about that decision um, and whether you remain committed, nevertheless, to protecting the Chesapeake Bay? Thank you very much, Senator. And yes, we are committed to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, personally, I've been going there since I was a kid, so I, I completely understand that. Um, it's an important resource. The ecosystem is important. Um, uh, our budget includes $36 million for work in the Chesapeake Bay, including restoration activities and management of parks and refuge lands. Um, and the goals of Chesapeake Wild are consistent with the administration's emphasis on locally driven con conservation and equitable access to the outdoors. So we will um, absolutely continue to make sure that Chesapeake Bay is a priority for us. All right, Madam Secretary, we'll, we'll, I'll be working within this committee with my colleagues, Senator Tester, the chair, the ranking member, and others, and I'm, I'm confident we, we will restore it. But it, it does not send a good signal <laughs> about the Department of Interior's commitment to uh, the Chesapeake Bay, that that program got zeroed out. I understand there are other issues there. I, I do want to commend you and the National Park Service uh, for the work done by uh, the uh, National Park Service's office in Annapolis. Um, we are working here on the Hill to establish a Chesapeake National Recreation Area, uh, and the superintendent there and the Department of Interior have provided important technical assistance 
uh, to our efforts. Uh, Congressman Sarbanes in the House and I in the Senate uh, hope to introduce uh, legislation to establish the Chesapeake National Recreation Area in the coming uh, months uh, and look forward to working with you and your team to get that done. Do we have your commitment to work with us on that? Absolutely. Thank yes, you. we'll work. We'll work with you on everything, Senator. Thank yeah, you. No, I look. I understand the budgets have to go through OMB. I get that, uh, but I, I we I was surprised. I just have to say on, on the zeroing out the wild program. Um, the other issue regards the Chesapeake Bay Office of the National Park Service because um, in last year's budget uh, you provided an, an increase in that budget to help it with its operations. Um, which also include administering right now what's called the Chesapeake Gateways and Trails Program. Um, after we passed the budget, uh, that additional increase for the, for the Annapolis National Park Service was not implemented. So uh, this year, uh, you, we're going to be working with you and your team to make sure that the increases that are reflected in your own budget are passed on. Uh, and we think this is a priority. So do we have your, your commitment to work on that? Y yes, yes. And, and um, the budget for the Chesapeake Bay office in 2024 is $1.05 million. So um, we will make sure that that, that office gets the Thank you. Budget. No, I, yeah, as I said, what happened with last year was uh, the number in the budget was one thing, but when it was actually implemented, the increase for that, that office did not go through. So uh, when we see the number of increase, we, we really need to make sure that office is funded. They're, they're taking on a lot of responsibility right now. Let me just uh, turn finally to offshore wind uh, mm -hmm. deployment. Um, Maryland uh, has a very uh, ambitious uh, offshore wind program, and I shouldn't say ambitious because we're actually implementing it. Uh, we're going to have two major offshore wind uh, projects, uh, which will power uh, provide power for over 600,000 Maryland homes and is estimated to provide 10,000 jobs. In fact, the Department of Commerce has already been providing grants on apprenticeships and workforce training. This is all very, very real. Uh, so we want to make sure that we maximize the ability uh, to, you know, catch wind power. Uh, yes. There will be issues coming up ar around the total expanse of uh, area that will be available for mm -hmm. wind power. Um, and we look forward to working with you uh, to try to achieve, make sure we can maximize that. And I just want your, your commitment uh, that you'll work with us uh, to expand the reach of our, our wind power operations um, in, in Maryland and the Mid-Atlantic. Absolutely. Yes, we, we, we love to have your support and appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you and your team, and thank you for your service. And I look on this on this budget issue. I know you have to make choices, but this is one that we had been led to believe was a something that the the department was fully committed to. And I, I know you are, but budgets matter. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary, earlier this week, a uh, federal judge. Uh, issued a preliminary injunction uh, and ordered the Department of Interior to resume uh, quarterly federal oil and lease, uh, oil and gas lease sales in North Dakota, the federal district uh, court judge in North Dakota, uh, finding that the BLM failed to follow the law and hold lease sales in 21 and in 22. And so my question to you is, will you commit to complying with the court's ruling and within two weeks provide a schedule of 2023 lease sales for North Dakota on BLM land. Thank you for the question, Senator. And um, um, I know that ruling was very recent. Um, we are reviewing that ruling and what impact it will have. And um, of course, I we're happy to keep you informed as to how we move forward with that and appreciate it. But we'll follow the law. So you commit to complying with their ruling and will you, within two weeks, provide a schedule of 2023 lease sales for North Dakota on BLM lands? I can say that we're committed to following the law, and we're moving forward with regular onshore lease sales. When can we anticipate getting a schedule from As, as soon as we, I get back to my office, I will ask my staff, and we're happy to keep you informed. We would like it that is. schedule so we can inform our people. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, 
Last week, I joined uh, Senator Mullen and others in sending a letter to BLM Director uh, uh, Tracy Manning Stone requesting clarification on the Bureau's accounting for uh, APDs, approval of permits to drill. As you know, BLM recently lowered the number of unused APDs from 9,000 to 6,600. Mm -hmm. That puts into question uh, the use of the Biden administration's, excuse me, the Biden administration's using erroneous data as a reason not to follow the statutory requirement for timely lease sales. Gas prices are 41% higher nationally uh, than when the president, current president took office. U.S. oil production is down nearly a million barrels a day since the current administration took, took office. In general, do you agree that prices are higher for a product when demand is greater than supply? Thank you for the question, Senator. I, I just want to say that uh, on federal lands, um, uh, permits are high. There is more production on federal lands than any time in history right now. Do you agree with Senator, uh, with Energy Secretary Granholm's call on oil and gas companies to increase production to help minimize harm to American families? I, um, I appreciate the question. We are, I, I want you to know that we're moving forward with the permitting, uh, and yes, the permitting um, was due to a database um, failure, and since that has been uh, 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 essentially fixed, um, we still have thousands of permits that are unused. So production is moving forward at a very high rate. Do you acknowledge that you took, uh, the first you had a moratorium on, on production on all federal lands, then you came back and agreed to only 20% of the lands being available, and you increased the uh, royalty rates by 50%. Now, do you think that would help increase production or deter production, in your opinion? What I can say is that production is up. It's at an all-time high. On so you think by land. restricting access, by slowing down permits, and by increasing royalty rates, that increases supply. Senator, now, remember, gas prices are almost 50 percent higher today than when you, when you came into office. And, you, and you're, you're telling me that you think those actions helped increase supply when we're down a million barrels a day. In production, domestic production. Uh, if I could just say, with all due respect, Senator, we are moving the permits through since I have been in this position. Uh, they, the, our office has continually moved permits through, and uh, we, we, there was a lot of land leased. Uh, we're moving those permits through. Those are being processed, um, and production is at an all-time high currently. Do you think restricting access to federal lands and increasing royalty rates helps or hurts production and supply? Which? Senator, uh, I really just want to let you know that we are moving those permits through and that production uh, is at an all-time high. And that's on why, our and that's why production in this country is down a million barrels a day, right? Because of what you're telling me. The production on federal lands is not down. It's actually up. Many of the... Uh, when you talk about federal lands, very often out there, <clears throat> there's a split estate. In other words, there's private minerals or minerals owned by uh, non-federal entities, but also owned by federal entities. Because the BLM and other federal entities ha are continuing to hold up these leases, that disenfranchises the other mineral owners. Do you think that's fair to those mineral owners, and what should be done about it? Thank you for the question, Senator. I know that creating efficiencies is, is helpful all the way around. We, we really want to help solve problems. Um, the BLM's core responsibility is to ensure development on federal lands is done in compliance with federal requirements. We're always going to follow the law. Uh, of course, we want to be helpful where we can, and we will help to solve problems where we can. We're happy to discuss this with you in detail. and. Um, see how we can work together. Do you think it is better for our country to get oil and gas from federal lands in this country with our environmental standards, or is it better to get it from places like Venezuela, Russia, 
uh, Middle East and other places with vastly inferior environmental standards. Where, where would you prefer that that oil and gas come from? Senator, what I can say is that uh, President Biden is, is, is dedicated and committed to making sure that we have an energy independent nation. Well, but the response to my question, where would you prefer to get that oil and gas? Our, our, as I mentioned many times, the oil production in this country is up on federal lands. We are doing, uh, we're moving those permits through, we're doing our jobs, and um, I appreciate the question. Well, but you do acknowledge that you have restricted access as far as production on federal lands, and you have raised royalty rates. Do you at least acknowledge that? I, uh, we are working to make sure that the, um, that the work on our public lands is balanced, and um, we, we care deeply about the fu ener energy future of this country. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to uh, start by thanking Senator Murkowski and Senator um, <clears throat> Merkley for having this hearing. I want to thank you for being here, Madam Secretary, and your crack staff. Uh, I appreciate uh, you appearing in front of the committee. Um, normally, uh, I would have to explain this situation, but you're Native American. I think you understand this situation. I'm from Montana. I literally hear every week about law and order issues on the ground due to lack of officers and due to four facilities. Most recently, it's been the Northern Cheyenne. But the truth is, it happens in every reservation where we don't have adequate facilities and we certainly don't have enough law enforcement officers. I understand that the BIA has been working uh, with the Northern Cheyenne tribe to improve public safety, uh, which, by the way, uh, from my perspective, is a disaster. Public safety is a disaster. And uh, I appreciate uh, the BIA working. I appreciate you working to try to improve this situation uh, during a meeting with the tribe in January, BIA committed to doing everything it can to fill the vacant positions, uh, increase community and recruitment uh, at the Rocky Mountain Regional Detention Facility, and hire a chief of police. Can you uh, tell me where the BIA stands in fulfilling those commitments? Senator, thank you so much for your commitment to tribes as well. Um, and Yes, tribal um, uh, public safety and law enforcement is th probably the most prioritized issues of tribes across the country. So we hear about it often and we work very hard to remedy these situations. Um, the BIA OJS team is working closely with the Indian Affairs Office of Human Capital on several strategies to support recruitment and retention. That is really one of the big issues. Um, the foremost strategy is a pay parity initiative, which will bring BIA law enforcement pay levels in line with other federal law enforcement agencies. And, and we'll get into that in a second. Okay. Can, you, can you tell me, as per the Northern Cheyenne tribe, where are we from a BIA perspective Spe of fulfilling the commitments? And, 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 and look, uh, uh, Brian was out there uh, a month or so ago, and I appreciate that. In fact, I think he was out there multiple times. But, and I don't have to tell you this, because I think you know this, literally every day that goes by without them having the police that they need, people are dying. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a couple, it's a lot. So where, do you know where the BIA is in a commitment to fulfilling Northern Cheyenne's needs? I, with all due respect, Senator, we will get back with you on those specific details of Northern Cheyenne, but I want okay. you to know that we all care deeply okay. about this So, situation. as do I. I mean, and the, and the problem is this isn't an isolated case. This is a case that continues. If it isn't in Northern Cheyenne, it's going to be Blackfeet, or it's going to be Fort Peck, or it's going to be somebody else. <clears throat> but I think Northern Cheyenne is, has the most acute problems right now, and mm -hmm. so I would appreciate your attention to this. Now I want to talk about what you were talking about, and that's your budget in regards to workforce recruitment and, reten and retention. Um, you've got about $641 million in this request, FY24 request, $470 million going to staffing, recruitment, retention efforts, 
police services, detentions, and corrections. You put the number in. Is this your number or is this OMB's number? Um, it is after careful consultation. Um, it is our number. and um, So you, you believe that this will adequately put you in a position to be able to not only recruit new officers but retain the ones you have? Uh, we think that it will be a good start and a good help. Okay. Of course, this um, tribal justice and law enforcement has been underfunded for decades and decades. It has, and it's and we've had crime in Indian country due to a lot of things, poverty included, that has put us in a situation where it's unacceptable. It's just flat unacceptable. I don't care what administration it is, it's unacceptable. You happen to be Native American. I don't have to explain the situation to you. I would hope that you would put the resources necessary to make sure that we do our level best and make the trust responsibilities we have to make sure these tribes are safe. Let me talk a little bit about Fort Belknap Water Settlement. Um, it's the last water settlement in Montana. Uh, it is almost ready for prime time. Uh, it is my understanding that the tribe and the DOI are ironing out details now. Uh, the notch has been removed, uh, and it, I know that was not an easy decision and probably not a popular decision in Fort Belknap. Uh, but because of that, they were able to get Senator Danes and Phillips County on board. I believe that is true. That's what my notes tell me. I haven't been told that directly. If that's the case, I think there's a real possibility that this bill can pass. Mm -hmm. And we can finish the last water settlement we have for Montana. I... Don't think this is going to happen without somebody like you in your position as Secretary of Inter Interior intervening and making this a priority. This tribe's been waiting a long time. I voted and we passed the Blackfeet Water Settlement when I was in the state legislature 20 years ago. We're still working on it mm -hmm. at the federal level now. So could I get your commitment that you'll do your best to make sure this is a top priority for not only the department but for you to get this water settlement uh, uh, approved? Yeah, yes. That's an easy answer. Thank you very much. Um, I've only got 44 seconds left, and if I got into what happened at the, at the, at the park last year, um, it's just going to require a lot of resources. And, and I would say this, um, as long as i got 30 seconds left, the disasters that are being caused by climate each year is just absolutely devastating. And and I'm going to tell you that that one incident in Gardner was a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's a conservative figure or not. And so, and we've got another year coming now where we're giving the snow starting to melt as we speak, as spring and summer comes on. But resiliency is really important, and I know you know that, and we've got to do everything we can do to do that. Last thing I would say is, is there was a uh, St. Mary's project is important. They had a, a study for... Uh, ability to pay it came back said they had no ability to pay uh, I would hope that that you continue to look at that project too along with the Fort Belknap project because they are connected uh, so we can get these these projects done in Montana thank you very much Mr. Chairman thank you Madam Secretary thank you Senator thank you Senator Tester and Madam Secretary uh, about uh, 10 miles from my house there is a a uh, Maya Lynn design bird blind on the Columbia River where Lewis and Clark uh, camped. And that bird blind is constructed so that as you're inside of it, you really can't see out. But what you do see is on the slats of the bird blind, it has the species that were recorded in Lewis and Clark's journal. And then it says whether they're endangered or whether they're extinct. And it's really quite stunning to think that in the, the very modest amount of time since Lewis and Clark came to the region, how many species that he saw have become endangered or extinct. And uh, we know that's an ongoing uh, process, and, and climate chaos is, is uh, aggravating it even more, along with uh, uh, the development of our, of our uh, industrialized world. Uh, the um, Endangered Species Act is an effort not just to focus on a species, but on an ecosystem that supports that, that species. And your budget for the Fish and Wildlife Service includes $133 million for the recovery and delisting of, of uh, species, or $15 million more than fiscal year 2023. 
Uh, funding is used to minimize or remove threats that led to species listing in the first place. Can you explain how the proposed funding level would be used to address the extinction crisis? Senator, thank you, or Chairman, thank you so much um, for the question. Uh, as you probably know, the ESA is 50 years old this uh, year, and um, uh, we're very proud of the work that we've been able to do to, um, to protect species. One of the main things, of course, is uh, recovering so that they don't have, the species don't have to be listed. Um, since since the ESA became law in 1973, more than 99% of species listed under law are still with us today, so that's something to be proud of. Uh, the budget includes a $19 million increase for recovery planning, monitoring, and management in close coordination with service partners. Um, and uh, Fish and Wildlife Services Recovery Program works with partners to address threats to the species and improve their status so that protection under the Act is no longer necessary. So we'll, um, we, um, we recognize this, it's a priority for us, and we'll continue to work on it. Uh, uh, thank you, and I think if I had a magic wand, I would you know, throw a couple more billion dollars into these key ecosystems uh, that are, are, are threatened. Uh, but, I don't have a magic wand, but we do have a collaborative process to point out uh, the, the challenges. And one of those challenges is to insects. And I've, I've told many people the story of how when I was a kid and, and we would drive north and south through the Willamette Valley, uh, we'd stop at every gas station to take all the insects off our windshield. Uh, and that now, you're, if there's a single insect on the windshield, it's rare. And I was really struck by a letter to the editor in a newspaper last week that said it's told exactly the same story from mm -hmm. another individual about how uh, insects have vastly disappeared. And uh, one of those insects uh, that you and I have been engaged in, it's, it's such a charismatic species, uh, is the monarch butterfly. And um, can I just tell you, I really... Uh, uh, Love your earrings today uh, that represent the, the, the monarch. And uh, that in Department of Interior, under your leadership, was so helpful in holding a monarch summit uh, to bring together the scientists, all the collaborators on, on what's, what's going on there. We were down for the Western Monarch in 2020 to less than 2,000 surviving butterflies which is incredible when we were talking about many, many millions in the 80s and, and 90s, just 2,000 left. They have rebounded in the last two years. Uh, when they have a good year, they can rebound, but they're still 90% down from the historic numbers. And I'm waiting to get a report now on the uh, freak snowstorms that hit the coast in, in California. Uh, because they may have dramatically devastated, once again, the overwintering butterflies. Uh, those overwintering butterflies cannot survive in cold weather, and so uh, that they, they hover along the coast to get more temperate um, uh, air, uh, be less likely to freeze, but a, a snowstorm, well, that's, that doesn't belong in Southern California, and it, it certainly uh, could have devastated them once again. So they, they are uh, deeply endangered, but they're not recognized as endangered. Is it possible for us to, well, I know there's a long list of species uh, that are under consideration, but is it possible for us to uh, get the monarch uh, into kind of the, the top of the list for consideration? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I don't think there's any person <laughs> in this world that doesn't care about monarchs. So, um, so you have a, a you have a whole department who who really understands the value of these beautiful um, butterflies, and and so we absolutely um, will work with partners to enhance the inventory monitoring. Um, of these pollinator populations across the National Wildlife Refuge systems. Um, that's where we can really uh, give um, monarchs and other insects and, and um, species opportunities to flourish. Thank, thank you, because um, um, I, I know that kind of the, the, there's hundreds of things under study, but um, sometimes the dramatic change is so evident and when you go from millions down to just 2,000 butterflies and and have an overwintering population that a freak storm could could devastate the remaining remaining uh, population because uh, it, it's just like they need to be 
put at the top of the list for consideration of uh, being labeled as an endangered. And, and there's so much we learn from studying their migration and, and the impacts uh, along the way. There was $7 million in the last uh, past appropriation bill for the Western monarchs and other pollinators. Uh, and um, can we ensure that the uh, NIFWIFs, that is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, collaborative model continues its momentum? Yes, Senator, we'll do whatever we can. Okay, there's a lot of, a lot of power in that in, in ability. Uh, I have used up my entire seven minutes on the monarch, which I'm proud to do because can you imagine the next generation of, of children growing up that never see a monarch? And actually right now in, in Oregon, it's extremely rare to see one. Uh, and um, so this is kind of a last ditch five alarm fire, but I have a lot more questions to come following my colleague and partner, Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Secretary, let's talk about the um, Alaska Native Vietnam Vets um, mm -hmm. Uh, allotment program. This is something that uh, that is also very challenged. Um, you certainly have a legal obligation to Alaska Native Vietnam era vets to ensure their allotment applications are completed in a timely and an efficient manner. And um, I'm, I'm really concerned about where we are in the process. There have been different iterations, different ways to try to advance this. Um, but I'm really concerned that right now BLM, BIA don't have the capacity to meet this task. The program expires in Dece excuse me, <coughs> December 29th of 2025. Um, that's actually not that far away. And <coughs> we're at a place right now where potentially about 2,900 applications could be received. Um, I know for a fact that there's over 500 in the southeast region down in the Tongass, <coughs> excuse me, that are not participating because they don't feel that there are lands that are accessible to them. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, right now eight, eight veterans have received their allotment under the program. In FY23, we got almost $5 million to implement the program. <clears throat> You're continuing this funding level for FY24. But how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? What can you, how can you assure me that not only that we have the resources, but what are the non-monetary challenges that BLM is facing? Thank you. <coughs> Please go ahead. Thank you, Senator. And... Um, Yes, we, um, we are working uh, very hard on this issue. As, as you know, there's roughly 29 million acres of public lands for selection. Um, we recognize that some lands are, were not included in the law, so it's unfortunate for those veterans who want lands in areas where they, where they weren't included. Um, so as of March, uh, the BLM received 266 Alaska Native veteran uh, air, Vietnam era veterans allotment program application. Some of those we didn't have, uh, a lot of the veterans who were eligible, we didn't have the right um, contact information. Uh, we reached out to Veterans Affairs, they're helping us with that. So we are d we're doing what we can to make sure that all veterans have this opportunity. Um, um, and I just I just want to assure you that it is a priority for me. It's a priority for the BLM, and we will um, we will continue to to just work on this as quickly as we possibly can. Um, I think that part of the issue was that we weren't able to reach them all, but we found a uh, we found some help with Veterans Affairs. So we feel like you know. It's, a, it's an all-of-government approach. Well, and Madam Sec Secretary, if I may, because I was at that roundtable with Secretary McDonough. Um, Senator Sullivan had brought together a group of uh, Vietnam veterans, and <clears throat> they had the Secretary of the VA in front of them. They could have mm -hmm. talked about anything. They could have talked about health care. They could have talked about housing, education. But all they talked about was, was <clears throat> the injustice that they felt in having been denied their, their native allotment and, and a fear 
that they were dying off. They, they were leaving this earth before the promise was going to be kept to them. And so I think, I think it actually motivated the secretary to see what more he could do in his capacity. So I'm glad to know that he visited with you. Mm -hmm. I, he shared a follow-on call with me and said he'd discuss this with you. We need to identify. But when you say, yeah, there's 29 million acres that um, have been made available, um, when you are in a state that is one-fifth the size of the United States of America and you tell a Native veteran in, in, in Huna that they're able to select lands um, up in the interior, it may as well be telling them that they can select lands in Iceland. It's just not feasible and not possible. So I am, I am deeply frustrated um, uh, because even with the good intentions of those who want to see uh, these allotments move, um, advancing eight through this process out of a potentially close to 3,000, um, it, 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 it doesn't work. It doesn't work for the veterans. It doesn't work for any. And so we have so much more to do. Um, I think you know that the answer is going to be making more lands accessible in areas where our veterans are. And, and that's going to require some, some cooperation with, uh, with the Department uh, of Interior. So I'm just asking you to keep your foot on the gas with this on, because, because these honored veterans are, are passing um, every day. I want to, to ask about um, the uh, tribal LWCF fund that you mentioned. Um, you have, uh, uh, you're proposing an additional 12 million in discretionary spending for land and water conservation under a new fund for tribal land acquisition. What I don't understand on this is why Department of Interior did not propose this under the mandatory $900 million from the Great American Outdoors Act. And, 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 and kind of what the plan is for this. This is the first time that I've, I've heard about it was in this budget presentation. So I'm not quite sure why it was, if it was such a big priority, why, why it wasn't um, incorporated in, in the LWCF initially, maybe as a tribal set aside, but now you're adding $12 million on top of a $900 million mandatory spending. Um, Senator, thank you so much for the question. And um, so, of course, we've done more tribal consultation in this um, in this administration than uh, likely for a very long time. Um, this is something that tribes spoke with us about. It's important for them to have a dedicated uh, program. Um, and it's carved out of discretionary funding to avoid competition between new and established programs. Um, uh, the funds will support tribal acquisition of lands for conservation and outdoor recreation consistent with the purposes of the LWCF. I mean, I, I, I apologize. I don't know the, uh, the precise um, reasons why it was done this way. Of course, we are happy to be in touch with your office with uh, complete details about how this came about and uh, what the, um, you know, who, who uh, what the thinking was well, behind all of it. My, my time has expired, but know that we do want to follow up with you on this. I'm just not certain that, that there is, is a plan there with the distribution and what the process would be um, how you're identifying willing sellers um, and the like. So we'll, we'll need to do some follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, uh, back to Monarchs for just a moment. One of the things that came out of that uh, uh, gathering, uh, the summit that we held, uh, was that uh, families want to plant to pollinator safe plants in their gardens, but when they go to the nursery, most of those plants you buy in a nursery carry such a heavy level of pesticide on them that they are not safe for the pollinators, could actually kill them, uh, and also true for the, the, uh, the milkweed. And so one of the goals was to develop a, a program 
that would provide labeling so you have a pollinator uh, safe according to certain standards that have been raised without pesticides that remain on the on the plants and and would be uh, deadly to bees and and butterflies and and so forth. Uh, has there been much progress in actually implementing a, a program for pollinator safe uh, labeling? Senator, I. I love that idea, and um, I will have to get back with you as to how that is coming along. Thank you. Uh, there are two routes to doing this. One is uh, kind of a voluntary effort through the Xerces Society, uh, but the other is for us to have a, uh, a regulation that says you can label these plants pollinator safe if they've been raised in this manner, and uh, people are just families. They want to plant pollinator gardens, and it, it's not just, you know, I'm using the monarch, but it, we're really talking about honeybees, all kinds of pollinators that are, are important. Um, so I'll follow up with you on that. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, turning to uh, staffing in the National Park Service. So the 10,000 employees that the department lost uh, all between the decade 2010 to 2020, 3,000 of those were in the National Park Service. And last year we were able to restore about 500 of, of those positions. And how is progress uh, going on, on hiring for those positions? Uh, we're so appreciative of your support for this, and uh, we are with you. We know it's important. Um, uh, so uh, the 2023 funding increases will support permanent long-term staffing for ongoing park operations. Uh, let's see. Um, uh Funding is helping NPS to staff new and critical responsibilities at parks, uh, Birmingham Civil Rights and Freedom Riders National Monuments, Amachi National Historic Site. Um, so, uh, let's see. We are, I mean, we're moving forward with it and uh, appreciate, if, if you'd like, we're happy to give you a readout on uh, where, you know, where these staff are and, and thank, thank you. how we've been able to build them up. Uh, it's an in in incredible uh, national parks system, but it only works if we have uh, people staffing it. And one of the things I'm hearing is about the housing crisis, that uh, so many accommodations that might have been available for people to work for the National Park Service and live in are now Airbnbs. And so essentially folks are turning down jobs even at Yosemite, the crown jewel of the park system. Uh, people are turning down the opportunity to work there because there's, there's no place to, to live. Your fiscal year 24 request includes an increase of $7 million to improve housing construction, nearly doubling the program, and to upgrade housing at a number of sites, Mesa Verde, Chaco Cult Culture National Historic Park, Great Sand Dunes, um, and, but it is housing across the system that is, is uh, challenged. How, will this funding make a, make, a, make a difference? Yes, absolutely. It, it will make a, um, a big difference. Um, uh, the $7 million increase, uh, as you mentioned, will address housing needs in those areas. Um, and we're using $32.7 million in construction and legacy restoration funding to rehabilitate the housing at Mesa Verde, Chaco Culture, Great Sand Dunes, et cetera. Uh, we're also leveraging private sector leasing uh, for seasonal housing. Uh, the National Park Service will use $2 million provided in 2023 as of February. Parks hope to add more than 100 beds with this particular funding. Um, we're working with partners to find solutions at Acadia National Park, for example. We're leveraging $5 million in partner donations with Centennial Challenge Funds to construct new seasonal employee housing for the park. It's, it's essential. People can't take jobs if they can't afford a place to, yes. to, to live. Uh, turning to the Great American Outdoors Act, it provided $1.9 billion for the legacy restoration funding for deferred maintenance on our public lands and at the Bureau of Indian Education Schools. And we're finding that the costs have gone way up uh, and a number of projects are, are, are over budget. Uh, we know that there's a lot of upheaval in the markets and upheaval in our supply chains. Uh, so this is it's happening in every area where construction is involved. And uh, our teams work together to provide a contingency fund to, to help uh, cover that challenge. Uh, but digging a little deeper on this, can you share a little bit about the factors that are causing the cost estimates to go up beyond the original estimates? Uh, thank you for the question. And... Um 
So what our bureaus are seeing is a more competitive bidding climate, um, and sometimes we don't receive any bids for the work that we need done. Um, so we have to recompete um, those bids. Uh, it costs more. There's problem in remote areas. Sometimes there's not the folks who you need um, to do the work. Um, we have a lot of specialized skills with a lot of really unique assets, and sometimes uh, we don't find the specialized people to um, or materials, for example, to um, to work on those uh, projects. Uh, there's also been an increased cost of construction materials that's actually outpacing inflation. Um, there's a lot of price swings. Um, and so we're working through a lot to try to um, keep a lot of these projects on track. And um, so we'll just keep working at it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's clear that um, the purchasing power of the strategy has, has diminished significantly. Uh, and it's, it's frustrating, but it's just a reality of the market. Um, do you support extending the Legacy Restoration Fund for at least another five years, given the, the backlog of projects that need to be accomplished? We love the Legacy Restoration Fund. So, yes, we, we, would, we would love to see it continue to do the work that it does for so many areas in our country. Thank you. Uh, Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, welcome to, to the committee. Um, I have a question uh, on, on fish and wildlife. Uh, our Fish and Wildlife Office in West Virginia has brought on just uh, recently a number of new biologists, mostly through reimbursable agreements, to help with the backlog of the Endangered Species Act six, Section 7 consultations. It's been helpful. Um, but what I'm really looking for is some substantive feedback on how we can improve this Section 7 process, minimize project delays. We're just getting a lot of complaints consistently in our state. So uh, in a reaction to this, I was able to put into the appropriations bill, uh, FY23 bill, that would direct the Fish and Wildlife Service to report to congressional committees within 90 days on the Section 7 consultation and provide recommendations on ways to improve and expedite the process, trying to get rid of the backlog, because there's a big backlog there. Um, and so we're right at the time of this, uh, around the deadline. So I wondered if, when, when we could expect to see this report, and can you shed some light on some of those recommendations made to improve those consultations? Thank you so much, Senator. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't, I mean, we, we'll get back with your um, office about when to expect that, but. Um, please know that we are, the Fish and Wildlife Service is making the most of limited staffing, funding, and other resources for the Section 7 um, and other reviews. Our budget request includes a proposal to authorize agencies to transfer bill funding to support uh, this Fish and Wildlife staffing needs. So um, we are, we're, we're working on, these, um, uh, on this issue. Um, and happy to report back to you as soon as we have some, uh, well, they, they might have specific details. Unfortunately, I don't have those specific details in front of me right now. Okay, we'll follow up. We'll follow up with them. Um, I, I am curious to know, I know I mentioned that we have a lot of um, frustrations in our state. Is this a nationwide problem with the backlog? I'm assuming that it is, but and the process taking so long and project delays? Um, Senator, with all due respect, I just, they reminded me that the goal for the report is today. Right. So, so um, it will come so out today. Yes, we're, that is our goal. Uh, it's oh, today. Good. So hopefully um, we can make sure you, that is in your hands before the end of the day. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. I apologize. So uh, response to, is it a nationwide uh, issue? You're hearing this from other states with the backlog. Uh, I am I am not certain. Of course, uh, I will get back with Fish and Wildlife Service and 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 make sure that they can provide you with that um, specific. I would like to say the director of Fish and Wildlife, in response to my concern, did come to the state with me uh, to to try to um, establish better communications, and I'm very appreciative of that. It has resulted in slightly better communications, not so much with my office, but with whatever the stakeholder is, is who's interested in, in trying to move together a project. So please pass that along to her. Let me ask you about another program um, 
the abandoned mine land economic revitalization is called AMLER program. Um, it administers gra uh, grants to, say, this is reading from your statement, to six states, three tribal nations, to return legacy coal mining sites to protective uses and foster economic and community development. You've made, uh, through the AMLER program, $750 million, uh, available to um, coal communities, obviously critical in my state, mm -hmm. and we've taken advantage of the AMLER program. There has been here, uh, and this goes to the bureaucracy as well, kind of a moving of the football of what the parameters of this program are so that there's been delays in getting monies that have been approved by the governor, because I do believe it has to go through the governor for the governor's approval uh, for certain projects. And because of that, um, I guess I would just ask that the takeaway from my comments are that the consistency on what's required, what qualifies, what qualifies as a coal community. You know, we had a trail uh, in, a, in one of our state forests that uh, the backside of it was where the uh, abandoned coal mine land was. Seemed like a layup to me. I mean, you know, it's a conservation project. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's well used. Recreation. It's also an economic generator because a lot of people will go and and come and visit. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of um, uh, uh, communication issues. So, I would just ask, in the, in particular, on the Amler program, that maybe t uh, leaving here, you might take a look to make sure that the guidance is consistent from year to year, so that people can know what they're applying for and how to make their applications successful. Absolutely, right. we want the program to work. And, right, and and you're right. Your state is is perfect for right. these uh, projects. All right, thank you. Senator, you bring up a topic and you get the report the same day. I, uh, you know, it's magic. <laughs> I, I need some of that. Uh, thank you uh, for demonstrating how that's done. Uh, uh, Madam Secretary, I want to turn to the Western Oregon Operating Plan, or, or WOOP, as it's referred to. And uh, this is a plan that coordinates the approach to wildfire response, uh, coordinated between the state, the tribes, the communities, the Bureau of Land Management. And we have this incredibly complex checkerboard that was uh, established when every square mile was, was, every other square mile was essentially designated the railroads, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's no way to design a landscape for management. Uh, and so it requires this sort of, of cooperation. And uh, after you've been to Oregon, I know you've heard uh, and seen what we face in Western Oregon and the uh, uh, concerns of the constituents. The key is that we maintain that this agreement, when it comes up for a renewal in 2024, and uh, we've, we've heard some concerns uh, that there might be, BLM may not be that excited about this agreement, but given the checkerboard lands, um, and the need for collaboration on the wildfire front, to me it's essential and, and, and you may have gotten a better sense of it from your trip. Um, uh, are you familiar with the, the, the WHOOP and can we count on your support to ex ex reauthorize it in 2024? Um, uh, uh, Chairman, yeah, meeting we had, uh, we absolutely know that uh, these fire partnerships are a key success to Western Oregon and to the entire state, quite frankly. Um, the BLM is confident that they will find an agreement with the state. Um, I. I trust that they will, and so we'll absolutely keep working at it. Th uh, thank you. I, uh, uh, I'll continue to be in dialogue with you all about it. And speaking of fire, one of our uh, highest risk fire sheds, actually the higher risk, highest risk, is the Rogue Valley in Oregon, and it is uh, affected by this checkerboard. And most of the forest land is not uh, Department of uh, Forestry. Um, but it is BLM land. And uh, so uh, we need to really reduce the, 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 the risk of fire and means uh, directing resources uh, to do forest uh, management, uh, reducing the fuels on the forest floor, the combination of, of, of thinning and prescribed burns and mowing. And we had uh, a significant amount of hazardous fuels funding in the annual appropriations, but also in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act for high-risk fire sheds. I want to make sure that uh, a significant share of these funds 
go as intended to, to help out the Rogue Valley. Can we count on that happening? Y yes, Senator. And um, so if I may, um, th they're providing close to $1 million in bill funding this year for Jackson, Josephine, and Curry counties. Is that... I will follow up with with you in that in that regard because I don't have the specific okay. numbers with me for the the need. Yes, but it is it is uh, uh, a, a a big deal, and um, after having seen the Labor Day fires of 2020 and uh, town after town burned to the ground, uh, this is in everyone's mind yes. about the uh, the the risk and the need for intense collaboration. That's where the WHOOP comes in, and that's where this uh, uh, funding comes in uh, to be directed to these, to these efforts. Uh, the, um, uh, okay, fish passage. Uh, very important uh, to fish passage in the Pacific Northwest is the Fisheries Restoration and Irrigation Mitigation Act, or FREMA. It's a cooperative partnership between, again, like WHOOP, between the federal government, local, state, and tribal entities, and they work to design and implement, that is construct, fish screens and fish passage uh, strategies, uh, solving the problem that culverts uh, put on, on many of our streams. And for the first time, we provided $5 million specifically for FREMA activities, and I want to make sure it does not get lost in a larger uh, funding pot, and can you give me an update on, on the FREMA funding? Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service will publish a notice of funding opportunity to award the funds through grants. The notice will detail eligibility, project criteria, and so forth, and requirements for the selection process. Uh, and uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service will also work directly with the five eligible states and tribal representatives and encourage partner outreach to develop project submissions. Um, the awards will be determined by a panel of subject matter experts. That is moving forward, and we will That's great. care about it. Uh, thank you. And my last question is uh, related to the opportunity we had to visit uh, the Gone Fishing Hatchery, for, known formally as the Klamath Falls National Fish Hatchery. Uh, and we were able to hold in our hands um, both uh, a Schwamm and Koptu uh, fish. Um, and those two species were like the, the, the core of the uh, um, diet that supported the, the tribes from time immemorial. Uh, but but they've not been able to harvest any since before the turn of the, the last century uh, because they are so endangered. And a few years ago, I held a, a summit. These are in in the uh, English vernacular. They're, they're suckers, um, sucker fish. And we held a conference uh, to talk about these two, two species and how we're going to save them because what we heard was that the youngest fish left in the lake we're 25 to 30 years old, and, and that the lifespan is only 30 years. And I, I had no idea their lifespan was that long, and had no idea that they, the youngest were that, that near extinction. And so we launched uh, this, um, this hatchery, uh, as well as a Klamath tribe hatchery, two separate projects, and you and I were able to visit the, the one. And I must say, um, I was so excited about that stop. Uh, because initially when the hatchery produced uh, year-old fish and we put them back in the lake, they all died. And they're dying because uh, the algae is growing in the warmer, uh, phosphorus-polluted uh, water. Uh, and when it uh, dies, it strips the oxygen out of the lake. And then a second species of algae takes the nitrogen from the first species. And then that's a toxic algae. So older fish could survive, younger fish could not. And then uh, we tried two-year-olds and basically... Almost all of them died. But what we just saw was that some of the three-year-olds, two- and three-year-olds are starting to survive in the lake, which is great. While we go under many decades of trying to clean up the lake and the, the phosphorus in it and, and address the algae problem, but also that they had three-year-old fish now at the, the hatchery, and technically it's not yet a hatchery. Uh, they're catching the minnows, uh, or the, the, the newly um, uh, formed, formed fish, and taking them uh, to the gone fishing uh, basins. Um, but they said by the time they reach five years, they will have a reserve population that will be able 
to harvest the eggs and actually turn it into a hatchery. And, and it's like, we may save these two fish because of this collaborative um, effort launched over the last couple years. So um, that's, that's going to be an extraordinary story if this succeeds. And it, it was the first time I heard, like, we may be able to, uh, we may have acted in time, barely in time. Um, could you comment on the importance of these in investments uh, and, um, and saving uh, uh, these fish? Absolutely, Chairman. Thank you. I, um, I was equally as moved by that stop that we made. And um, gosh, you, no amount of money could ever bring those fish back. Yeah. Once we lose them, they're they're gone, and uh, and we know how hard it is to get the uh, phosphorus out of the lake. Uh, we've had uh, local engineering students who have developed uh, 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 basically sunlight powered, <laughs> photovoltaic powered mm -hmm. rafts that that put oxygen back into the lake. That didn't actually seem seem to work, um, and. Um, uh, we we th explored and are continue to explore ways to try to remove the algae and removing the algae, remove the phosphorus in the algae to try to reduce the phosphorus load in the lake. That proves to be extraordinarily difficult. We don't have a strategy there yet. Uh, but if we can raise older fish and get those older fish that can survive in the lake in while we continue to work on the phosphorus loading over the decades to come, uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a shot at reversing a near extinction event. Yes, and we are, and we have many dedicated career staff to um, move those issues along. We, I mean, for some of these things, it's every tool in the toolbox, right? And we're not going to turn down any good idea. So uh, we have to continually explore um, ways that we can protect these ecosystems because that is the way we protect these species. Madam Secretary, uh, thank you. Uh, we, we, the, the diversity of topics that have been raised today demonstrate what an enormous range of, of issues are inherent in the management of the Interior Department that you are living and breathing every day. So uh, thank you for addressing them. So many offers to follow up on, on details. Uh, my, I believe my colleague is not returning. We're wrapping up. OK. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with Senator uh, Murkowski, uh, two states in the West that have different perspectives on some key issues as reflected by our opening statements, uh, but uh, we're just engaged in a lot of collaboration on our, on our public lands and the, and the work of the Interior Department. So uh, thank you. And the hearing record will remain open to the close of business on April 19th. If there are no further comments, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>